My name's Joe Warner and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Unfiltered. Today I'm in Ibiza to meet James Haskell, the ex-England international rugby player who's now trying to forge a second and equally successful career as a DJ. I want to ask James, now he's retired, to look back on his career, the highs, the lows, what he got right and what he got wrong. But I also want to know what he thinks about some of the biggest issues, not only affecting sport, but society at large. James, good to see you. How have you, you been? Are we hugging or what? Yeah, let's I'm do gonna, it. I'm a massive hugger. <laughs> I'm not used to hugging people that big. James, we're here in Ibiza. Yes. You DJed last night. I did, yes. You DJed this morning and you're DJing tonight. Yes. Is this work or is this holiday? This is, well, my wife thinks it's not work. It, it is work. Um, we've had a few arguments about it. I mean, she's, she's very supportive, but, um, you know, kind of extending your trip out for a couple of extra days is probably taking the piss a little bit. But I, um, I had to obviously do an interview with you guys today. I'm going to DJ, hopefully, at a boat party um, later. But it's work with fun, really. I mean, that's why it's the perfect job. That's why everyone wants to be a DJ, really. Since retirement, you've obviously tried your hand at a number of things, podcasts, books. Is this is the music where your heart's really at? Is this the passion? Um, look, I think everything's centred around performing, to be honest with you. I'm a, I'm a massive attention seeker and, and, and I really enjoy performing. So none of my work feels like work. You know, the books are storytelling. The podcasts are storytelling, long format co content that people really enjoy. You can be kind of yourself. You can be verbose, you know, articulate. You can go and, you know, go on different journeys. The DJing's telling a story of music and performing. You know, it's a transition from, from, from rugby into this, whereas I was part of a team sport. You know, you're now an individual standing in front of people and you've got the pressure of trying to perform, capture people, um, try to make the whole room, you know, have a sense of love and party and stuff. And, it's, and it takes a lot of skill to do that while kind of making sure you're matching the tracks correctly, cre creating a vibe. So, yeah, I think if I could do only one thing moving forward, and it would be DJing. But um, it's obviously a tough nut to crack, really. How does the buzz compare? Say the highest level you attained yeah. in rugby versus the, the highest peak you've had so far with the music. Is there any, you know, you've mentioned team sport, now you're solo. Is there any kind of crossover, completely different buzz? No, I think, I think you're thinking of it, I, I see them as two completely separate things, really. I, you know, I pl played rugby to the, till I couldn't walk anymore, run anymore. I couldn't do any more with it. I squeezed all, squeezed all the juice out of my career. Um, and then I put a lid on it and I, I did, I'm done with it. You know, I, I'm a big believer that, um, you know, life's const a constant process of evolution, achieving more. I, I would hate to be a bloke, you know, 10 years after retirement, um, you know, and the only thing I talked about was playing rugby. It's like, what the fuck have you been doing for the last 10 years or so on? You know, I think if you win a World Cup, that's fine, but I wouldn't want to be that bloke, you know, when I'm 60 and I walk into a room and say, oh, that's like James Haskell, he used to play rugby for England. I think you want to constantly evolve. So I, I, I think they're completely different. Yes, you know, the, uh, playing a buzz, running out of Twickenham, playing for 80,000 people, that opportunity to, to perform. And, you know, I never really cared much about rugby, to be honest with you. I, I, it was my, it was my path of excellence, really, and it could have been anything. It was something I found I was good at, um, and I found a linear structure of you put the work in, if you perform, if you train, if you work hard, um, you are rewarded. And in most areas of life, that's not the case. Most people judge their success on whether they, they earn money. Um, you know, mine was very straightforward. If you weren't good enough, you were told you weren't good enough and you, weren't, and you, you didn't play. If you were good enough, you got opportunities. Um, and it was very physical. And the more work you put in and, and how dedicated and focused you were, you had success. Um, and that's quite rare. And I think, um, you know, DJing is, is much, it's very different. Everything else is very different. You know, book sales, what? You know, do you write a book? Is it become Sunday Times bestseller? Is that, you know, is that the peak? Or do you want to be, mm. you know, do you want more? Do you want a number one Sunday Times bestseller? You know, if you DJ, you know, I'm last year I had one gig and I beat for this year I've got 11. But am I playing where I want to be playing? No, I really enjoy playing Ocean Beach. It's a great honor. But do I want to be playing in, in the wild corner in high and, or amnesia or some of these? Like, yeah. That's the dream, really, um, and you've got to keep progressing. So, but with rugby, it was very straightforward, and I think that that for most people they don't have that path, and that's why sports so good because it it kind of keeps things very level and very clear and very transparent. So, my journey with rugby was great, but I don't compare them. I can't do anything. It doesn't matter whether it's a better buzz now. I've got no buzz from rugby. So, I for me this is the pinnacle, and I think getting to perform in front of a crowd, the emotional, emotive effect of the music, the 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 vibe that the um, the crowd are giving to you, I think, is mega. You don't miss rugby at all. You don't sound like it. No, nah, don't, don't, not at all. Not, not one bit, really. I, I mean, I, I miss running. The, I mean, I miss getting paid to 
um, to do what I love and be physically fit and be um, in good shape and have discipline and life is much simpler in that regard. So I miss those elements. I don't miss playing because there's no point missing something I couldn't do. Well, what's the, it's, it's a way, I'll be being completely ruthless. It sounds a bit sort of wanky, but uh, unless it can make me money, I enjoy it and it's helping me progress in any way. I just don't think about it. I just, just what's the point? Like pining after something, it's never going to come back, so just forget about it. If you ringed every single part of your talent out of your rugby career, what does the equivalent look like when it comes to DJing? What do you think is the, the peak of the, the potential that you can achieve? I mean, I think to, the DJing thing for me would be a residency in, in Ibiza, would be DJing two or three times a week around the world. You know, you're playing big clubs, you know, there's a list, I'd love to play Tomorrowland, I want to play High, I want to play the Wild Corn, I want to play Amnesia. Um, I want to play some stuff with Affected, I want to do some stuff with Tool Room. There's, there's a whole kind of plethora of things that I'd like to do. And actually, I haven't really even cra- scratched the surface. And most people still don't know I even DJ. That's the weird thing. I still meet people, and even by the pool here, you know, I played a disco set this morning. And people are uh, like, oh, I didn't know you DJ, I didn't know you DJ. I'm like, I couldn't post any more about it if I tried, really. So is that humbling? Is that a bit like, how have you not noticed me? Or do you realise no, that no, just shows you how far you've That's what I mean. No, I don't see it as like, I, and I never take, I mean, I, you know, Whenever I meet anybody, I'm a, you know I'm a Z-list celebrity, so I never ex- expect anyone to know who I who I am. I always introduce myself. I never assume anything. I just think it shows that there is absolutely no consciousness out there that I'm doing it. So you know people know me for rugby. So until I get to the point where people go, oh, you, you DJ, that's what I want people to know me for. Now rugby's done. Is that a blessing or a curse, though, James? Because you've obviously got that platform because if you know an incredibly successful international athlete, but then obviously you're. That, that's something that you can easily be labelled without yeah, yeah, I think that, no, I, don't, I don't think it's helped me. I think um, it's probably held me back. I think it's a tough sell. I think people find it hard. They will always see you as a, as, as a um, celebrity DJ as opposed to a proper DJ. Right. But that's why you're going to make the music. That's why you're going to play the, 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 the shit gigs you don't want to play. That's why you're going to keep working and performing and, 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 and knocking on the door, really. And I think uh, I'll have to run, you know, double as long and double as fast to get where I want to be, but it'll make it all worthwhile. And every time someone tells me I can't do it, I just go and do it, double down, do more. Are there parallels with rugby? Because you've admitted before you may not have been the most talented player, right. but with work ethic and just that resilience and the relentlessness, you were able to get ahead. Is it the same with music? The fact that if you're good enough, you are going to get recognised if you keep working hard enough? Yeah, so look, I wrote a book uh, that came out, oh, I can't remember now, like six months ago, seven months ago, called uh, Approach Without Caution. It was kind of much more about this mindset stuff. And, and I approach everything in the same way I approach rugby, which is I split up everything into manageable things. So, you know, if you ask me to be a DJ, it's quite abstract. So how would I do that? Well, you know, got to learn the skill, mm-hmm. got to got to make the music, got to, you know, seek feedback. You've got to work uh, with other DJs that are better than you. You've got to constantly keep learning. You've got to get know your technology inside out. You've got to listen to other DJs. There's only 10 things I've given you there that you can be getting on with. Uh-huh. And so there's no excuses. And I think this, the application of what I did in sport, which was, Going the further, you know, the, the the extra mile, reinvesting in myself, finding other people to help me, be, being self-aware, listening to people's feedback, recording your sets, reviewing yourself, being harsh, hustling the fuck out of it, not accepting, you know, um, no for an answer, creating your own magic in your own stuff. I think for me, that's you know, that's really the the, the way forward. And I think uh, I do the same thing in DJ. It's exactly the same thing. I, and I, you know, same thing in writing books, same thing in, in podcasting, same thing in running a business, same thing in after dinner speaking. I apply all the same things because I think if you sit at home and you don't like something about your life and you and you honestly ask yourself, are you doing everything you can do? If the answer is no, it's your fault. And people don't want to accept that, especially in 2023. Everyone wants to make out that it's the government's fault or that you deserve stuff because social media makes you think that you're a special little unicorn when you're absolutely not. And I think, you know, if you want to make anything in your life, you have to hustle the fuck out of it and not accept anything and just keep working. Do you know what? You're going to have shit times. But you just have to keep going, and it's. Um, Do you feel that's missing? That a lot of people may lack that basic yeah, resilience. I mean, yeah, hundred percent. Success and achievement are not for everybody, you know. And I think we're we're now taught that you can be whatever you want to be, but it's just not true. You, you can't. You've got to, you know. That unfortunately, life's division of talent, ability, intelligence, upbringing, who you, who your parents are, where you're brought up, is just not fair. And I think you can try to to narrow the gap, but unfortunately, it's not. Life's not equal, and it's about the people who are prepared to to go the extra mile, to sacrifice, whatever your context is. It's easy for me to say I came from a you know, middle-class privileged background and have a lot of hardship in my, in my life. So you know, it's probably easier for me to say than other people, but I can only talk about my context. But I would say that most people don't have what it takes to be successful. Most people aren't self-aware enough. Most people don't want to put the work in. We're great at making excuses. We're now champion mediocrity. We're teaching kids about 
you know, it's just about taking part, which is bullshit. We're talking about not competition, which is bullshit. You know, no one got anywhere in life. They're not handing out jobs and handing out money because, you know, you just turned up. Everything's a dogfight. Everything from, from, you know, being successful, getting money, fighting for a job, fighting for a career. It's, we're, we're, you know, we're in competition with everyone. You see it with women in particular, without saying something, the competition between, women would rule the world if they weren't so competitive with each other because they're much more intelligent, much more kind of, you know, um, emotionally in tune, but they're very competitive with each other because it's wired into their DNA. You know, and men, men, are, <laughs> men are very simple creatures. And I think, it, I think we're going against all the things that, um, that make you successful. We're, just, we're doing people a disservice, but I think those who understand, realize that's the way it is really. It's, it sounds as though you feel that the modern world and social media is at almost a complete opposite end of the spectrum of what we should be doing naturally. Yeah, 100%, as, right. as the father of a young daughter now, how's that gonna shape you as you yeah. begin to teach her how to how to live her life and how to seek opportunity? I don't, do you know what, I don't know. I, I mean, the problem is, is that if you read, well, I mean, if you believe what you read, which, uh, you know, having seen what the media does, it's just such a crock of shit, all of it. And it's all scaremongering and, and, and nonsense. But I do think there are some fundamentals out there where we're getting ourselves so lost and I have no idea what she's going to be like at school. Because, you know, when I was at school, I didn't have social media. So, you know, if you, you fell out with someone or did something stupid, no one would film it. You'd never hear the end of it. Bullying's now 24 hours a day. People, you know, kids are making videos and content and doing stupid shit to get likes. And they are they are permanently damaging themselves for life and they don't even realize they're doing it they're all passing pictures and stuff they're all this you know this new gender stuff that you know we're trying to go at the pace of every slowest person we're trying to accommodate everybody giving everyone a million different options we're getting ourselves into such a mess where i think you know you, you always want people to have their place and everyone's just on a journey you need to be accepting of a journey but you just need to be very careful about what you expose people to and what you let people think and do um and also what you know, how, what they're taught and how they're brought up and things like on social media. So I don't know. I, I can't I tell whether them. you're angry or worried about being a dad. I'm, in I'm this. both. I'm both. I think I'm, ang I'm angry because I think, um, I think we're tripping over ourselves. Like I'm angry because big brands stand for nothing other than be seen to be doing the right thing. They stand for nothing other than making sure that they look good. They're the ones with the money. So they're the ones that they cancel people because, you know, if they told people on social media to go away, but they don't because everyone's so panicked. Like we're going to stand this person down. We're going to look into the way they are. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Because of that, that is empowered. Joe blogs. People think in 2023 that they are changing the world by complaining. By complaining, they fundamentally think they're making a difference and are actually not. What would be making a difference? Would be taking responsibility for yourself, worrying about your own side of the street, being better, being hardworking, look after your mind, look after your body, treat people well, work hard, and make a profound change. Moaning and complaining that you don't like something and trying to stop yourself ever having an emotional experience you don't like is where the world is going down the toilet. And the problem is we're now letting, now brands are empowering people. You saw, you know, you see what happens with Bud Light and these people, you know, they don't, they're just doing it because they think that's the right thing to do, completely misjudging it. They're, they're believing in the zeitgeist of stuff. And it's like, you know, just about any conversation, I think people now think that because they've got a voice, that they never had before, they've got to use it and they've got to complain, thinking they're making a difference. They're doing nothing but complaining. You know, and I, that's why like these prats, these stop oil people, you know, bolting themselves to floors, that they're doing nothing apart from alienating people. They're not raising any awareness, they're just upsetting everybody. Um, and they and they're wrong. What, what would be really good is each one of those people actually made a profound difference in their own lives was was um, you know, like that guy from Insulate Britain who went on this this more um Good Morning Britain and then told them, Well, I I can't afford it, so I didn't insulate my own house, like bro you can't ask other people to spend money. And you know, you see it with the Ukrainian refugees. They get, everyone's marching, we must house Ukrainian refugees, we should, must help them. And then the bloke went and interviewed everybody on the, on the, on the road, went, will you take them? I can't, I can't take one. Next one, can you take one? The problem is I'm only renting. Everybody wants to pass the buck and everyone wants to point at other people. And I think, just take responsibility for yourself. I don't worry about any of this stuff. Just worry about the side of the street. But I think with my daughter, I just don't know what the hell's gonna happen. I don't, I don't, I don't really know about social media. I just don't know where to even begin. Like, what do you expose her to? What do you not expose her to? What do they teach me? You know, like, I don't, I can just imagine me getting called in for a parent teacher meeting over something ridiculous. Like, I don't know, she misgendered someone or did something stupid or something happened or something. I mean, you know, I'm just going to be like, please don't ever call me again. Just, I'm just, I'll go, my wife has to deal with this. I've got no time for this shit. I can't do it. Is, I think so many people do want to see a positive change in the world, but it's almost, you don't quite know where to begin. For instance, you were recently, there's some controversy over women's rugby, some yeah. comments you made on, on a post. Yeah. I don't want to go too much no, no, in, no. into that, but at the same time, how frustrating was it for you where you are trying to make a point and trying to say that women's rugby needs more attention, needs more to yeah. be part of the spotlight, yet any comment you make, someone seemingly yeah. instantly jumps upon it and criticizes you. Yeah, I mean, you. I, I, the only thing I regret about that is um, 
is, is well, I mean, didn't really apologise to be honest with you. <laughs> but so, would that be your regret that you did actually apologise? Yeah, 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 yeah. What I said's true. You know, the, the person who complained was we'd actively gone out of our way to help promote women's rugby. We we set up our own female version of our podcast to promote women's rugby. We tried to help it instead of instead of coming at the friends and people that are trying to help. You should go at people that don't, but they didn't. They waste the time. And, and the woman who, who did it knew exactly what she was doing. And she'd been on the podcast two weeks before. And the, the, the use of language saying, you, you know, you guys have to stop continually, um, you know, uh, not I thought, what is it, continually sort of riding rush all over women's rugby. It's like, it was a male only channel with two men in the picture um, talking about the most, like what, it's just, it's, a rel it's just such nonsense. So I think... So do you feel like you are a force for good for women's equality in sport, yet oh. you're, it, you don't really want to put your head above the parapet because you're going to get shot Look, down? Look, I'll be honest with you, it comes down to, it's not even the moral issue, is that I don't say anything anymore because I lo it lost my money. And I, and I can't, that's as far as it goes. You know, what, I, in I, terms of commercial I'll partnerships put, yeah, that's and it, yeah. I just, I, don't, I literally, I couldn't care less about any of that stuff. Couldn't care about them. I mean, you know, and the, the thing is, there's some sort of lunatic... Um, sort of faux journalist woman who got really involved in it, you know, talking about allies and we don't need people like you. It's like, look, women's rugby at the moment makes no money. Um, it's a fantastic game. It's growing faster than anything. I think it should do everything that men's rugby didn't do. I think, you know, it's great seeing we've got these heroes now that are playing an amazing brand of rugby and I think they're capturing imagination. But it, at the moment, it needs men's rugby to help promote it. Will it always have that? No. Do, do women's sport in general need men to help them, yeah, you know, it just doesn't have the viewership. You know, there's a reason the Kardashians are billionaires and there's 80,000 seasons of Desperate Housewives. A lot of people are watching that and not, and not women's sport. Um, so how I frustrating is it for you when you feel like you, you want to use your platform to actually uh, benefit women's I mean, sport? I, I mean, I was frustrated. It was very frustrating because they just, you know, they, people made me apologise and I didn't want to apologise and I didn't actually apologise. I just said a hundred different words a way of not actually saying it. Um, so you take it back completely? I didn't then. take it back. I didn't, I didn't apologise. You right. watch the video, I didn't apologise. I just right. said, um, you know, I just said, look, I... Uh, you guys misinterpreted this, this is unfortunate. Because the truth of the matter was that, the, that, that it was a, um, a female woman who posted the tweet, who posted the Instagram post, and she saw nothing wrong with it. And that's the point. She's a female rugby player, two of them worked in the company, and I got upset because they were upset with themselves over nothing. That's why I got involved. And uh, they didn't want to admit that they, there was a women was rugby, it was two female rugby players, because they knew there wasn't a problem with it. Right. But then they had to chastise themselves, going, we should have done better. It's like, no, you know you didn't do anything wrong. You just allowed social media to get into your head. And then I just stood up for them. And so I, I don't, I just, I didn't care about it then. I don't care about it now. I'm just more resolute that I just don't comment on anything uh, because I don't, I just don't want to lose money. I, just, I don't care. I don't care enough about any of it to warrant it. It's not relevant. It's not if, like when I truthfully mean about the complaining, if my first reaction is, can I do better? Can I be, can I improve myself? I've never thought about running onto social media and like going, oh my God, I saw the most offensive thing and like chastising an individual. I've gone, you know, am I, am I angel? No, am I a bit of a prick? Yeah. Do I do a lot of bad things? Do I get things wrong? Yeah. Maybe I should worry about myself. And that's my first reaction. And every time I've ever got myself in trouble is me trying to share an opinion over something I wasn't that asked about. I was just more upset that these girls who work for us were, were, you know, feeling upset and like chastising themselves. And we were getting criticism. And I was doubly upset because we, the person who criticised, we'd gone out of a way to help. And the, the use of a language that were basically inferring that we were always sort of neglecting women was just bullshit. And, I, and, I, you know, and, then, and then it all runs away with yourself and everyone calls me a you know, misogynist arsehole and everything else. I just think, worry about your own side of the street. Really, that's the, basically the message is, I don't post. A lot of these things I don't care. I just don't care yeah. about it. I think every, I accept what everyone wants to be. If you want to be a lemon, be a lemon. If you want to do, be, be gay, straight. I don't, everyone's on a journey. Enjoy yourself. Uh, just be accommodating and remember that not everybody sees the world as you see it. And that's all you've got to remember. And my journey is different to your journey. And if you just accommodate to everybody, we can all get on with it. And just worry about yourself, really. You've got a pretty thick skin and would be the first to admit you've been called a far worse things than, than a misogynist in your time, right? But what about Chloe? Because since we've become a mother, she's had some pretty horrible comments hmm. online, on social media, on Instagram, on her posts. I can totally understand how you can kind of take yourself away from criticism you yeah. get. What about when it's her? I mean, they're morons, the people who, I just, I feel sorry for them, I, I don't. But you probably can disassociate and take a yeah, step back. Yeah, because I, 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 it's not one of those, you know, like when your mum, when you're a bit of a dick as a kid, and your mum goes, they're just jealous, and you're like, you, you believe, and then you realise later on, it's probably because you're a bit of a dick. I feel sorry for these people. Like, I, you know, I think, uh, I'll give you an example, you know, uh, stuff like when Bodie, my daughter's going to sleep, we put a cover on her, right, and put her in the shade, and people see it, you can't put a black cover over a baby in the sun, it's like, Thanks, babe. I wasn't going to leave. You know, we're not, you know, more. So everyone's always got an opinion. Everyone's wants to share something. They always goes, I think you should just know that this is this. And, you know, if I go, if I like whole milk, people go, oh, 
you do know that cows are destroying the environment. Why have <laughs> almond milk? And I go, well, I like coffee. Well, I like tea. It's like, sh I just don't, I think Chloe, Chloe doesn't want to be offensive. Chloe doesn't want to upset anyone. She's much more accommodating. I just don't care. I literally don't care. It's like, I, I equate it to a, um, like a blue bottle buzzing at a window. They make a lot of noise. They bump their own head. They achieve absolutely nothing. They don't get through the window and they ultimately die in the corner. And it's like, I don't, I you're just don't not care. worried about kind of protecting her though because the criticism it's no. an awful it's bollocks it's not I, I i look at it i look at it and go is there, any, is there any validity in what they're saying no and she doesn't and she's she's so much more articulate and um intelligent and verbose than i am in, in that regards and she always shuts them down i just don't give them the time i just delete i delete my I, you know I stopped blocking people because i realized that um that every interaction was earning me money so i don't care right. like, i mean i don't want to go block people i think to myself well actually i'm the very fact you've commented and kept this and kept keeping up interaction, keeping up, it, um, what's the word? Uh, sort of, you know, um, engagement. So you're actually helping me. So if you don't like me, perfect. Just keep following me, keep liking, keep commenting. And it's kind of perfect time, really. On a much more positive note, fatherhood, has it changed you? Because for a lot of people, kind of there's before kids and then after yeah. kids. What's been the main change for you, James? Um, I think for me, it's maybe much more um, emotional. I think it, it, I was very lucky, you know, Again, with, with, with having a better baby, there's, there's so much, I saw so much pressure that women put on other women, which I think was, is amazing, um, about kind of, you know, all the, not, do you breastfeed, do you do natural birth, do you do this, do you have drug, it's just such bollocks. Like, as long as the baby's safe, the baby's okay, and the baby's born well, that's all that matters. No matter how it got there, mm -hmm. or how it happened, or whatever you do, that's the number one priority. And it's not, you don't get points down the line for having a home birth naturally, uh, we're taking no drugs. Your kid is no further forward in life mm -hmm. than without that. So I saw that. I was very interesting about it. I think a lot of dads struggle to bond with their kids straight away because uh, they don't have the the, the primal connection that the mom, mothers have. You sort of, you know, it's taking your partner away from you. There's this thing that's screaming. I was quite lucky because from the first moment I saw Bodhi's um, heartbeat on the very first scan, I was like, I fell in love with it. I was like, right, this is this is it. And so when my wife had an emergency C-section, the baby came out, I got to hold her for... 45 minutes while she was stitched up, skin on skin. You know, I changed the first nappy. I was, you know, I was involved straight away. I tell you, it's maybe, like I said, I, I've, I've cried more in the last year <laughs> than I have at any other time in my life. And Did I it think, hit you at the time? Like, yeah, holding I cried like a baby. Like, as soon as I saw it, I cried, I just burst into tears. Um, like, just couldn't stop, couldn't stop really. And I think- Were you expecting that? Uh, I don't know really what, I don't think I, I'm very practical, like I don't, I don't get too, uh, you know, excited or too down. I just, I very much live in the moment, um, which, you know, can be quite self-serving at times and quite selfish. I think from all the stuff I've said so far, you, you probably glean that I'm quite selfish in terms of just worrying about my, myself or my side of the street. I think the only thing with the thing with a kid is is the um, just the continuous m m emotional roller coaster you're on. So like, I used to wake up in a pretty simple routine, go down for breakfast eat my breakfast, go and train and whatever. Now I wake up, I go and see my daughter. She might be bouncing to see me. She might say like, dad, and I'm like, oh God, I'm also gonna cry. Then she will shit, <laughs> then she'll shit herself. You're like, okay, brilliant. And then, and then, you know, and then she'll you know, go feed, she's puked and, and then she starts walking, hugging, and you come, you go hug and she hugs you. And you're like, just every day is now an emotional roller coaster, which I never had, which for a practical man is very difficult to navigate. And I, and I, I you know, I constantly now just always emotionally overwhelmed with it, but I, it's taught me to love or it's taught me a love that I didn't know was possible. I think you, love is very um, individual to different situations and different people. I, I don't think you ever love your partners in the same way. I think you have your parental love that you have for your parents they have for you is probably pretty, pretty similar. But when you have a kid, it completely and utterly changes and you're like, oh, now I know what love is. But it also means I've now got something to, to worry about and think about all the time and have constant fear about that she's gonna be okay. Like she keeps falling over and smashing her head on the floor and you're like, I just, that's why I was quite late to having kids. It's like, I really don't wanna have something that I'm gonna to have to be constantly worried about all the time, and, and, but in a good way. Um, How did you adjust not to being center of attention? Like everyone's the, the star of their own I movie, I am still right? the center of attention, mate. But you, uh, no, uh, in seriousness, Dan, how, how much have you had to kind of take the back seat? Uh, or do you still see yourself as, I, I'm the, man, I'm the no, main man of the household and no, it all revolves around me? I never saw that. I think again, I, I'm, a bit of an ambivert, really. I, I, if I'm around a crowd, I, I want to show off, I want to talk, I want to perform, I'm a performer. 
but I'm very comfortable on my own. I'm very I spend a lot of time on my own. I eat on my own. You know, I'm happy to read. I, I, you know, I, I don't have a problem. So I'm quite. I don't. I haven't noticed not being involved. I think people who have kids to fix a relationship um, are completely mad. You know, we didn't. We didn't do that. But I think it does put pressure on your relationship. It changes things. I think you're tired and you're stressed um, together. And I think it, 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 you have to put a lot of work in. And I think. You know, one thing someone taught me straight away is when you come into the house, first thing is, is ask how you want, ask how your wife is, and then worry about the baby second, and just come in and do that, and it works like a treat because it could because you know everything becomes about the kid, and then mm -hmm. you stop talking to each other, stop asking questions. So the first thing I check on is Chloe, are you okay? How are you? And then check on Bodhi. You know. In terms of fatherhood, a lot of people when they, a lot of men when they have a, a baby, you tend to kind of look backwards and, and also look forward. How has it changed your worldview? Do, do you, for instance, do you look back at how you behaved towards women as a younger man and think about it differently. Also, do you have a more, greater sense of mortality now? You've got a little one. Do you think more about um, getting older? How has it changed your kind of worldview? Well, I think, I mean, there's two, two distinct questions. I think I, um, you know, have I gone on a journey? Well, I went to an all boys prep school, all boys boarding school, and was around 25 men every year for 19 and a half seasons. I didn't go to university. Would you say I was probably the most broad, broad uh, minded person in that respect. No, I think there's a reason why um, sexism is, is probably as bad as it is because of all boys boarding schools. <laughs> Truthfully, I think what other exposure do you have to women other than dancers as others as sex objects? Why? What? Why? What? You have t female teachers. You have, you, if you have a strong mother, but otherwise, how? Where you don't? You're not exposed them in any other way, shape, or form. So there's always going to be objectification. So I would never send my daughter to a same-sex school. Ever. Do you regret quick. being sent to Wellington? No. Even though the opportunities it gave you? No, because it gave me opportunities and because it was a school that perfectly played up to someone like me who had ADHD, who just could do, did everything. And it gave me confidence and opportunities and stuff. It's fine. But you asked me about kind of my view on women. Do you know, have I had to learn and unwind a lot of things? Yeah, of course. As long as you keep learning. I think that's why I, I find it so f stupid with all these people going back trying to correct history. You know, trying to go, you know, history is history for a reason. You, you know, as long as you learn from it today, you're not doing the same thing. Like, you can't go back and go, you know, I mean, again, it's contextual to me, so I've not been through it, but I just think trying to rewrite history and, and chastise people for now, it's madness. Worry about now, be better now. Like, why are you pulling statues down? It just don't, it doesn't matter. What are you doing now to make a profound change? And I think. Um, well, what about you look, rewriting your own history, though? Do you, you don't strike me as somebody who does regrets, no, but no. How, how do you look back at maybe perhaps mis misdemeanors? And, and I don't really. You don't, you don't consider it at all? Just, why? Why? I just don't care. It doesn't serve in any terms purpose. Of how you might be able to, I guess, well, learn from it? I've or, learned from it now. I learned yeah. from, otherwise I'm, uh, I think I learned from it at the time. I think you've all, I'm always in a process of self analysis you know, or you always kind of go, am I talking shit? Am I justifying behaviors I shouldn't do? But I don't look back and regret things. I, I think life's about learning. And I think you, where you were now, where you were before is where you are, you know, where you are now is completely different. As long as you're better now than you were yesterday, that's all that matters. And I, I only ever see it as that. If I'm 2% better today than I was yesterday, then then I'm in, I'm in a good place. And I think, you know, going back and looking, unless there's some lesson that I'm still falling foul of like you know me replying on social media you know when i replied to um that female rugby player i uh i already knew that i shouldn't have done that could you I, not help it was it just you, you got that yeah burn i just, in well, just and... i said i thought like, people were being victimized and i was like i just thought it was a crock of shit and i, I didn't think and then but i knew i wasn't supposed to do it so I, I have not responded since i just wouldn't i just wouldn't do it like i just wouldn't care i wouldn't get involved i wouldn't say anything you know doing the same behavior and expecting a different outcome is the definition of madness so i think as long as you learn and don't treat people badly, and that's the way forward, I think. Woke culture is obviously such a huge hot topic now, yeah. and social media, and everyone's polemic and, and become very, very tribal. Yeah. With rugby, I mean, toxic masculinity is such a such a big thing as well yeah. in terms of, you know, the beer, the banter, the birds. Yeah. What, what's your view on the whole kind of rise of toxic masculinity? I don't really know. I don't I mean, I don't really know. I mean, I mean, I saw something very interesting, actually. The other day, I read it, actually, I see it on my phone quickly. Because obviously, like kind of lad culture is something when you were growing up was was, was the kind of the, the way people were. It was all about going out and getting lashed and trying to trying to pull. And we've seen a big backlash against that that type of behaviour. Do you think kind of rugby will be diminished by by the by the kind of end of lad culture and the end of that? I mean, I don't know, but I'll read this quote right. So I don't know how accurate this is, but it says toxic masculinity. Forty-three percent of boys are raised by single mothers. Seventy-eight percent of teachers are female. 
So close to 50% of boys have 100% feminine influence at home and 80% feminine influence at school. Toxic masculinity isn't the problem, the lack of masculinity is. So I don't know if that's true, but I think about... So how about, do you interpret that, a lack of, of well, male I just role don't, models? I don't even ask. I think that's why, that's why people like Tate have, have come out of nowhere. Because men are lost. Men are being told you can't be men. What, you can't be strong, can't be chivalrous. I don't, we don't want people to open our doors for us. I don't want this. I don't want that. What? I, you know, you can't, be, you, can't have a, you can't be a rough man. You can't, be, you know, be, be physical. I think it's nonsense. It's bollocks. The, so, world, the world was built on, on men being men. And is, is sexism alive and real? Yes. Is, um, you know, is the, is the, the downfall of, of, of society down to the patriarchy? No. Are there lots of things that go unchecked? Yes. Could we be better? Yes. But is being a strong man um, a problem? No, I think it's absolutely not. I think, you know, being prepared to be angry when you need to be angry, being chivalrous when you need to be chivalrous, being loving when you need to be loving, not taking any shit, being successful, being hardworking, being, um, you know, a hunter-gatherer is absolutely fine. I just think, I th I it just doesn't, I, I, do you know what? All of this stuff just doesn't even imp impact my life. I'm sure- It sounds you, like it frustrates you more than bothers you. I just, do you want to, I think, the thing is, I, I think, look, it's one of those things, I obviously have an opinion on it, but I don't go around thinking about it. Right. So if you ask me, I, I give you a, a, a passionate opinion. Well, I'm gonna ask you something, you brought up Andrew mm. Tate. What's your yeah. take on him? Because he's more than just, you know, mentioned after open doors, isn't he? There, there, is, a, there is a darker side yeah, to him. Yeah, that. yeah, the possessive type, but that's, you know, it's madness. What, what, you know, why he thinks that women are things to be possessed, you know? I don't, I don't understand why you, I mean, it's mad that the, the women only got the vote in 1918. Men have a lot to answer for, and it, the fact it was even a thing, the fact that it was even a, a, a thing that we weren't equal and there wasn't equality, you know. I, but again, we're now we're going the, so far the other way. We're now trying to deny that men are more physical than women. There's a physicality that like they're equal, but their women will never be as physical as men, which doesn't make them better. But just accept, you you know, accept what's true. Women are much more emotional, in tune, and kinder, and sweeter than men will ever be. It's not, it's not better or worse. It's just a, it's just a statement. And I think we're now getting ourselves so worked up where we're trying to deny science we're trying to deny what people are actually like and also trying to deny that that, that that men are physically more able in certain aspects there are plenty of women that kick the fuck out of me i you know i i, I, I no doubt but more often than not i would be physically stronger than most women so can you see why young boys are attracted by the yeah, andrew tate because do you, you think because, if you were a younger boy growing up now you would be attracted to it um no do you know why because um i always had strong role models i always had a purpose and I was always doing shit. That's the problem with pe people now. They've got no purpose, they've got no direction, they ain't playing sport, they ain't exercising, uh, they, their role models are um, people like and on social media and they're just not, they're not out there. And I think I was too busy doing stuff. And you see now kids finish school at three, they don't play sport. They just kick around doing nothing. You know, they, they can, and I, they've got these false idols all over the place. And look, and, you know, Andrew so Tate- So why, why do you think? Because they're, because, that everybody's always looking for um, a guide on how to, they're always looking for a guide and a way out and a, and a role model to give them the life that they want. And you know, if you see someone rich, successful, former kickboxer, talking about shagging birds and making money and talking like a man and smoking, you know, that's why, why are people following Logan Paul and Jake Paul? Because they've watched them grow from nothing to millionaires to, to uh, uh, unbelievable sports people now, both of them absolutely carving up. Same thing with KSI, because people think if, if I do what they do, I can get where they are, and it's about it's aspirational, but, it, but it's dangerous because you've got one section of society telling men not to be like they are, and I think out of men, you know, people, they have these frustrations, I think, because once you have a common shared, um, Kind of when you hear when you, someone speaks, you go, oh yeah, I'm like that, I understand that, yeah, that's right, they go, they, they find people, I just think, if people had played more sport, had more purpose, more direction, discipline, structure, they would be fine. Sounds like all the things you got at Wellington, right? That was, yeah, that was or, essentially yeah, the sport, environment you were sport brought up in. Me. Sport, you know, like humans without discipline, unless you're a hippie in a commune whose, whose horizons extend as far as inner peace and whatever it is, I think it's fine. But if you've got anything else about you, you need discipline. Without discipline, we, we fall off the rails, we eat what we want, we drink what we want, we, we you know, take drugs, you do, do whatever it is, and you end up falling foul. People need routine, they need a purpose, a reason to get up in the morning, and they need to be disciplined and given direction. Kids especially need to be directed and need to have strong people around them, need to show them what's, what's right. And I think playing into the idea that 
you know men have a have it on the back foot and that that you know they need to be strong they need to be strong men and women of possessions is insanity um but he's obviously kept, kept his imagination because I'll, I'll be honest with you if you look at the, i think the average um iq or something is i don't know what it was i looked at it from my book but it's like so low you wouldn't you would be like wow if you're looking for young impressionable people who aren't that sharp he plays into it but i think you've got to have your own opinion like do i i just don't care about it i just think I guess it's very hard for, for a lot of people to form their own opinion now because so much of the information they get is from social media. And, and it's all folk. And everything is tribal now. Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's vegan or carnival. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's well, it's just, actually not now. It's every, it's, 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 because they've now invented a million different... I mean, I remember when I walked into a coffee shop and I go, can I have a flat white? And, and, that, and that was it. Now I walk into a coffee shop and I go, normal milk? I'm like, yeah. And everyone, everyone stops what they're doing. I'm like, what? I'm the mental one. I'm the mental one now. I'm like, oh, can I go? I went to a restaurant the other day and all the desserts were vegan. I went... Uh, you've got any desserts that aren't vegan? No. And I'm, well, what happens if I'm not vegan? I want something to have suffered in the making of my dessert, please. I want to have all the sugar, all the fat. Um, I want someone to have punched a swan for my swan burger. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't, I'm obviously being facetious, but I, what, I just, what, when did I become the mad one? When we talk about the trans debate around yeah. sports, where yeah. you're getting people who have transitioned competing yeah. against girls, what's your take on that? The honest answer is, I, I think people who should have the ability to um, compete in sport but they have to compete in their own competition. You can't, from what I know, if you've gone through puberty and you are and you have developed as a man, for example, and you take suppressors, testosterone suppressors, it really, really, really doesn't make a difference. So imagine me coming out of retirement, transitioning to a woman. The women rugby doesn't, as I said, you can't play, but imagine I transitioned into women's rugby, took testosterone suppressors, and play women's rugby. And you'd have to let me do it, because if you didn't, you were damning my rights and I was having it and I did it. Do you think that'd be fair? Because that, you know, that, that, that the Leah Thomas, you know, by the time I started my book, uh, transgender athletes were allowed to compete in swimming. By the time I finished it over the space of six months, they changed the rules. The rules are changing so fast, nobody can keep in track with it. If they, if the governing bodies can't keep track with it, and, and the ever growing gender debate, there's more genders coming out all the time. How's the average person in the street supposed to keep up with it. That's why you've got to be accommodating. You can't go and bully people and cancel people and chastise. You've just got to go, look, this is what we thought was going to be okay. We're now going against science, which if that's what you want to do, it's fine, but can we just be accommodating on the way? So I, I don't think I don't think that um, transgender athletes should be uh, you know, able to compete in um, sport. I just think, you know, men or, are just- Or given their own- their own Should have their own thing. I don't understand. Like, I, think you have the, I think you should have the Gear Olympics so I think you should have all the athletes who want to take steroids and do that. Like people throwing shit out of stadiums. I mean, it'd like be a hell of a spectacle, five, right? like five second, 100 meters, <laughs> like hammer throws, like fucking launch it. It's a gear Olympics. People might die. So that's not a problem. They like, you know, like, they explode. Um, the gear Olympics, and I think Chandler Jones athletes should have their own, they should be able to compete in the Olympics in their own divisions, in their own thing. And they should be fit. They should feel like they're welcome and accepted. And whatever they want to be, they absolutely are. But you can't go inside and you can't allow you know, men to go into women's sport and physically outgun them, and it, because it's pointless. It, you know, if they weren't winning all the time, it would you'd understand it. But the woman Leah Thomas, um, she uh, went and, and couldn't. You know, was in three hundred in the world, and then went and won every single race by miles. It's like. What, 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 and, and then if you, if you say they can't, you're then taking away someone's rights. It's like, no, no, she should be able to compete. She should 100% do what she wanted in her own division, which I think would be then, would be fair. But it doesn't make her any less of a woman. It just means that she can't, she just can't do it. Because we're, we're, you're then losing the purpose of women. Women have fought, fought this long, as I said, I only got the vote in 1918, have fought this long to, 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 to win battles. And then you're handing out women of the year to a, to a transgender person. It's like, well, how the how the hell does that work? I'd be livid if I was a woman. Like we, just, we could, we basically, we get, we, you know, we, it wasn't good enough, you know, it wasn't good enough for us to win, run the world ourselves. We've now gone in and become women and running it from their side. And it's like, imagine how offensive you'd be, for, for, you know. I, but I think women, I think transgender women should feel like they're women, whatever you want to do, but you can't go against science and you can't change science and you can't change what's happened. You should feel like you want to call yourself a woman, that's absolutely fine but you've got to have your own categories because you can't just accommodate everyone. People are going to see this, and you've already said at the start of our chat that you didn't want to kind of say things that would get you into trouble. You know people are going to react to this, so yeah. let, let's head it off. What, what do you say to people who are interested going to start on social when they see this clip? I mean, I, I'd say um, it's, not my, it's not my battle, it's not my journey. I can't, I, 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 
it's, I'm, you know, I know very little about it. I know what I know about the science. I know what I've looked into. Um, I hope everyone just feels. I feel. I hope everybody always feels they're respected and heard and safe and on their own journey. And I don't care about what what you are, what you want to do, who you want to be. You can be whatever you want to be. I just think that you can't, unfortunately, um, you know, for, for everyone that leaps forward, someone has to be oppressed. And I don't think that can be. That doesn't. Ha- doesn't. I don't think that's right. Why does some someone have to win and someone have to lose? Why can't you go? Okay, we're on this journey. We will accommodate. Why do you have to? Why do you have to sledgehammer your way into everything? And I, I don't. I'm a white middle class guy. Gender plays no role in my life at all. I have no problem with it. I don't, I don't have a problem with sex. I don't, I don't, it, doesn't, it doesn't interfere in any way. You asked the question, so I answered it from a purely um, sort of observation opinion. I know that, you know, one of the, the biggest sort of um, sections of um, society who feel marginalised and unheard of transgender people, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I want them to, to not feel like that, but I equally don't want women to get beaten up in sport and, lo- and lose because somebody wants to express themselves because I think that's a very dangerous precedent to set. It's not just about gender, it's about everything. And I think people should just, you know, be more accommodating on both sides and stop. Just because you feel like you've been marginalised and hated, don't go and hate and marginalise other people. That's not the way to fix it. Dave Chappelle talked about it on his very informed stand-up, which everyone wanted to chastise and cancel. I mean, I've sort of been cancelled so many times, it doesn't really matter. Then. You can't be cancelled anymore, no. right? You mentioned forms enhancing drugs there, James. How often did you witness people no, using never. in rugby never at all no, never what about you you see a lot of stats at the amateur level of of, of younger players getting into gear because they think it's going to help them transition into a, I, I, into a better or no, professional I, I, athlete i've never seen that i'd say i'd say there's a big um big thing of just young of men just taking gear anyway i think everybody i think every, because of the not the love island but the you know part, humans always want the path of less resistance the increase in steroids it's through the roof because people want the physique, so they all want to take shortcuts. No one wants to put the work in. I've never heard about it. You were never told, would. never encouraged, never nope. offered, never. It was nope. never said that you need to do this nope. to get to a certain level. No, nope. never. What do you think? What's your message to young guys now who are probably looking at gear more from a physique well, than a performance this, level? I mean, I wouldn't. It's not going to help you in rugby, and being big doesn't make you a better rugby player. And I think you know, if you want to go on stage and be a, a, a bodybuilder, then you know, crack on. I think. You know, pretending these guys aren't geared out of their brains is, is, is wrong. But taking care of steroids without the right diet, without the right training, without the right dedication isn't going to get you results. You're much better putting the work in, getting a decent plan, getting your nutrition right, and, and really, really going for it without looking for a shortcut. Which, by the way, everything you put in your body, there's always a check in the post. So we might not feel it today, you might not feel it tomorrow. But I, I remember seeing, I went and got my health checkup, see what my testosterone levels were like and everything else. The guy said he's getting a lot of influx of young men taking steroid, taking testosterone. They're shrinking their nuts. They're then becoming infertile. And some of them are uh, taking so much of it, it's burning out receptors in the brain and they're unable to get hard on ever again because they can't be um, sexually, sexually aroused. I mean, that's a pretty big... It's not worth the big biceps. Not worth the big biceps. I mean, big, bi- big biceps are important, uh, but, <laughs> but not, not at the risk of, not, of your knob not working. So I just say... You know, don't listen to John down the gym who recommends that, you know, if you've got low testosterone, go and see a doctor, go and get help, go and do it. But I would say that most people, if you put the work in and time and you train, you'll ultimately get there. You're still in great shape. You've been retired four years now. How important is your physique to you? How much of your sense of identity is tied to, to how of you look? Of course it is. Like my, you know, I like being big. I've always associated with it. I think for me, it's always been a really important um, part of of my identity really. Um, I don't train as much as I should do. I, you know, the DJ kind of lifestyle travel stuff is, is, um, is tricky, but I actually, I, I find that it centers me. I feel much better about life if I have trained. I feel that it gives me kind of, um, yeah, it just gives me a sense, of, a sense of purpose. So I'm probably not as fit as I've ever been. I've just started doing Jiu Jitsu again, which kind of, um, you know, I find the competitive element of it. I don't mind, you know, getting a bit hit actually is quite nice. Uh, or getting, you know, someone rubbed my whole face up the other day. <laughs> I just kind of like, it was quite like, quite like to be back in that being physical. But I think, again, men are meant to be physical. You're meant to, you're not meant to sit at a desk all day. You're not meant to not be, be physical people, you know? In terms of, of your physique and your career, a lot of people get into the gym, thinking young guys are especially, because they might feel a bit insecure about your body. Have you ever had that? Because you're a professional sportsman, have you been insecure? Is there still that inner course, demon I mean, saying got, you're not big enough, you're not strong enough? Yeah, Do you still course, have that? Of course, everyone that I, I struggled very, um, 
openly with self-confidence issues around my ability. I don't have body dysmorphia, but you know, am I comfortable the way I look all the time? No. Are there things that I would like to change about my body? Yes. Um, I don't, you know, it wouldn't drive me to do you know, mad stuff, but you know, I wouldn't have surgery or anything else like that. But I think you can always, you can always want to get better, but you also have to sometimes keep perspective. And I think that's quite hard. Um, at times, but um, you know, you, you can always be bigger, fitter, and be in better shape, and things you don't like about your body. But I've always tried to be. Well, I've always worked, and I've always seen a psychologist. I've always done it. I mean, more about my self, self confidence and self doubt than my body. But I think it's fair to say I sometimes look and go, I'm not happy with that. I'm not happy with that. But you wouldn't be human if you were. I was going to say, do you think you ever get to a point? Maybe you are playing the club. You've got the residency you want. You've made millions off the back of your music. What, what does success look like for you, James Haskell? Now you've retired, now you've got the rest of your life in front doing of you. What, doing what I love. It's not material things. I'd, I've had a Ferrari, I've had watches. I, don't, I just don't care about any of that. It's about experiences. It's about family. It's experiences. It's about being able to pay for dinner or for lunch and drink what you want, eat what you want and not worry about it. It's about finding comfort and it's about doing something you love. And that's success, and that's it. And I do, and I ha and I have that now, and I and I feel I feel very content. Do I want more. Yes, is my biggest downfall never being content and never being happy. Yeah, but since I retired, I've tried to work very hard on that in regards to my um, with my you know to, to to celebrate every little success. You know, when I was when I was playing rugby, I, I was always on to the next thing. I was always so critical. But I now take a moment to go, wow, that was amazing. Like last night's set was unbelievable. Um, you know, I don't know how many people were there, but they were absolutely having it. And it was a massive moment. And I, and I there was moments in there where I was more happy than I'd been in ages. And I thought, I just can't stop dancing. And no regrets, ultimately, right? Oh, look, I think you could always, look, no regrets is one of those things where, you, you know, it's kind of an excuse to act like a dickhead and go, oh, I, I don't regret anything. I think you, you, you're always in a constant period of self-improvement and review. So I don't regret anything. Is, is the stuff I would do better? Yes. The stuff I can learn from? Yes. Do I have to review, do I self-analyze and get feedback? Yeah. That's how you evolve. And it's as simple as being a little bit better today than you were yesterday. And I I was in bed by 1.30, whereas last time I was here, I got back here at 7.30 after watching Fisher play. So I'm already better this time round than I was last time round. You know? James Haskell, thank you Thanks, so much mate. for your time. Thanks, Really appreciate it.